and welcome back to our continuing coverage of the Dice Tower Convention 2018. Dice Tower, the only convention that has passed the Washington State Bar Exam. We're joined now by the legendary Richard, Richard Lanius, who's going to just join us for some nice conversation about what you got going on and whatever else comes <laughs> to mind. There is one person in this hobby where it's like, hey, uh, Richard, tell us a tale. And then Richard's like, all right, here we go. And he's going to start talking. So we're excited to have you on the show. And if you don't know who Richard is, just go out to BGG and look up his name and, and look up designer Richard Linus. He has 10 pages ten of games. Pages. 10 pages. I just checked it. And, and these, pages these, these are games. like card game, card game, card This is like Arkham Horror. Arkham Horror. Defenders, Defenders of the Last stand. stand. I mean, it's just game after game. I just played a game of, of yours last year, Fate of the Elder Gods, oh, which, yeah. which was a big game. And it's always great to have Richard around because uh, Richard lives in Greenville, South Carolina, Absolutely. just a few miles south of where I am. Another uh, good old boy down there I'd like to hang out with and everything. So Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Glad to be here. And by the way, legendary means old. They, they just say legendary <laughs> as opposed to old Richard, okay? So it's one, of these, it's one of these people that you probably almost guaranteed at least played one of his games because I think, you know, talking about Arkham, you probably have your hand a little bit in every bit of Arkham game, right? Some sort of producer or some sort of... Uh Pretty, well, you know, anything from Fantasy Flight, you know, they, they at least let me play test it and give them feedback. Okay. okay? So oh. at a minimum, and the nice thing is sometimes when I make suggestions, well, really all the times when I say, make suggestions, they, they at least you know, respond and say, yeah, that's a good idea, and they actually do it, or they're like, ah, that doesn't quite work because of this piece here. Mm -hmm. But it's nice to it's nice to interact with them. They're, they're just really good people to work with, lots of creative people, and they put out, I think most people would say, great games. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be working with them that they have the Arkham line. And I believe you had told me once before that they have, uh, like, an Arkham library where they have uh, all this uh, these facts and information and characters yeah. uh, that they've stored in, because they've created over the years, and you're responsible for a lot of those characters. Characters, I believe. I am. In fact, they released a book last year. I don't know if you saw the oh, book. I bought it. Okay, oh, well, I bought it. <laughs> that, that kind of is the Bible for all those characters where they wrote stories around all those mm -hmm. characters. So, yeah, and it's, it's great to, to look through there and see them. Now, I didn't create all the characters, but I, I created a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Uh, how, how did you come up with some of the characters that were, were in Arkham? Okay, well, the first character I ever created was Joe Diamond. Okay. Just because I wanted a tough as nails, you know, detective, and, and so Diamond sounded good for tough as sure. nails type yeah. detective, and a guy who doesn't really believe in any of this kind of stuff. So, so he was my first. Okay. And then I decided after I did him, Jenny Barnes was my was my second one, and I wanted somebody that would be like the opposite of that. Rich girl who mm -hmm. wants to be an adventurer. And she's actually tough too, but she's got money, okay? okay. So, <laughs> so, but then, you know, I, start, I, I started doing more and more. For example, uh, Carolyn Fern yes. is the uh, uh, psychologist, and uh, my wife's name is Carolyn, and, and my mother's name is Fern, so I just put those together. and. There was a name, and I kind of went from there. So, so did, I did, did a you, lot of characters like did that. Did you build the backstories for these characters, or just kind of like a uh, uh, psychologist, you know? Or did you build like like a little backstory bio? We built them as we went along. Okay, so so really, a lot of that came out, uh, you know, as moving into the fantasy flight version. In the original, one, we didn't really build the backstory, but I, in my mind, I knew what the backstory was. Okay. So, you know, and that kind of helps you figure out what kind of person they're going to be, what's going to be their skills, you know, that type of thing. So, yeah, you try to flesh out the character, you know. And, I know we live in an age now where everybody wants, a, they want a lot of games to be, if I want to play a female, it's this side, if I want to play a male, it's this side, you know, flip them over. But I don't, I don't do that with, with my characters in Arkham because they're like real people, mm -hmm. okay? So they don't change. So what I try to do is build really strong female characters, really strong minority characters, yep. really strong male characters. And you can play any of those characters, but they're like real people, mm -hmm. you know? So that's kind of how I try to approach it. One of my favorite characters I love to play, and I just forgot his name, is the uh, the musician from New Orleans. Oh, yeah. Uh, 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 Roland, Roland Banks, I think. Is, I think or Jim Culver. Oh, Jim Culver, that's yes, right, Jim Culver. I, I, Roland Banks is the, the bounty hunter. Yes, yeah, Jim yes. Culver. Jim Culver is like one of those characters I love to play because I like uh, like the musicianship side of it. He's from New Orleans and everything. Absolutely. And I remember you telling me one time that there was a gang or something in the Arkham Horror universe that was based on some of your family members or something? Oh, yeah, that, well, the, the, the Sheldon gang, which you always hear about in Arkham, uh, was actually a real gang. I mean, they, 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 they worked the southern Illinois section while Capone was controlling the northern Illinois section. Really? Really, and I remember my grandmother was always upset because I liked art, okay? And I never really understood why. My dad finally said to her, well, she's upset about that because 
because your 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 grandfather's father, his brother, was in the Sheldon gang, and he was a counterfeiter. He was artistic, <laughs> and he he was their counterfeiter. Okay, and so they told me the whole story, and I mean, I was a kid, I was like fascinated because the whole story was, you know, he went to. My, my, I guess my great-grandfather was fairly wealthy in Southern Illinois, but when they put his brother in jail for counterfeiting, spent all his money, okay, to, to get him out. Wow. His wife was all upset with him. He said, look, I made money before I'll make money again. Don't worry <laughs> about it. I'm spending my money. Got his brother out. His brother went right back to the Sheldon gang, okay? <laughs> and Capone decided to, according to their story, now, I, I, I can't prove any of this, but this is what they told me. <laughs> okay. it's, it's impressionable. The Sheldon gang finally went at odds with Capone. He wanted them to fall under his, and they weren't going to do it. So there ended up being like a war between the Sheldon gang and the Capone gang, which didn't go well for the Sheldon gang, okay? <laughs> and actually, my, my great uncle, I guess, uh, he died when his a house that him and some other Sheldon gang people were hiding out and got firebombed from an airplane. That from the an Capone, airplane. From an airplane that the Capone gang. <laughs> so that's the story behind the Sheldon gang. So I said, they belong in the game. <laughs> these, guys, these guys belong in the game. Who knows? And if I hadn't done Arkham Horror, I might be a counterfeiter. I mean, I, I got that going for me. <laughs> you hadn't heard that story all the way. Not, not all the way through. I, I had not. I see, and some people come in here and try to hawk games. Nah, we're not after any of that stuff. It's all about the story. That's what, and that's, that's one thing, too. You love telling a narrative story. Every time it's seems like uh, I remember a couple of Charlotte conventions, uh, one called Mace, you would, you would come around. I was playing a Euro, and you'd walk up, it's like, there's no dice in this game. No dice. Well, they're just pushing cubes around. And there's, and there's no story, there's no memory, okay? Now, look, I, I like Euros. I, I highly respect them. They, they are, I, I can see why people like them. Mm -hmm. You think, you try to plan, you build on a plan, you outsmart, you try to outsmart your opponents. Those, it's brilliant, and that's mm -hmm. why the games are so popular. There's a huge audience for those competitively. But... What I try to create is a memorable experience in a game. And I can't tell you how many people come up to me at conventions and say, you know, Arkham Horror is the first game I played, or, you know, I really love Arkham Horror. And they always start talking to me about a game they played 15 or 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and with great detail. I was doing this, I was in the dreamlands, I was trying to catch a zebra so I could get back and shut the gate. <laughs> and this happened like twice, and they're telling it like it's a real story, okay? Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, 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 you know? And what I want to know is, when's the last time a Euro player said, you know, I was in this game, and I had these two yellow cubes. <laughs> I, I, I traded them for a red cube. You thought I couldn't do it, but I got that red cube, and then I bought that card. You know, and I, I'll never forget it. <laughs> you just don't hear that story. That, that's okay, true. Euro players do not get upset no, with no. me. I admire those games, okay? I'm just saying the story's it, not the same. It doesn't create the same memorable experience. It's like a lot of people like to play role-playing games. Right. Because they're in the story, there's a narrative there right. that they'll remember for years. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not about what you're playing, it's the environment you're creating. Now, just a couple, or yesterday, we had Ignacy from Portal Games on. Yeah, and he, he loves says, to tell stories, yeah, too. Yeah, he he's loves a story guy, guy. And, I lo story. and I love that, of how he does it. And he includes a lot of Euro stuff in it, so he yes. kind of satisfies both mm -hmm. groups. I wish I could, but I simply tell people I'm not smart enough. <laughs> you know? And I learned that it's fun to roll dice. Now, some everybody doesn't like it, but I like rolling dice. So, you know, since I make games, well, most Mostly for me. That's why I do them that way. We just played his new game that's coming out. Uh, uh, this uh, a Gen Con called Detective, and it's uh -huh. a very much a narrative game. You're trying to you solve a mystery. Deductive game too. A very much deductive oh, yes. game. Oh, yes. And he was like the same thing. He said, "I love watching people play my games and watching them deduce and then hear the stories that come up from it." Yeah. And he said that's just, and that's probably the same thing uh, for you. So here's my suggestion. I think you and Ignacy should get together and create an ultimate narrative game. We would have right. fun doing it. I'm pretty sure that would be great yep. except he's real busy and I'm real busy but <laughs> if we ever if it ever lined up I would love to do it Shoot, there's a bunch of people Eric Lang, there's a whole bunch of people oh, I'd yeah. love to design oh, games yeah. with out there uh, the biggest problem we all have is we all have projects yep. you know and me I'm kind of retired I'm kind of half retired but I'm always working on three or four projects at a time mm -hmm. but most of my projects are committed so uh, companies that are waiting for those are probably late I'll just tell you right <laughs> now, you know, 
I'm retired or tired or something in between. <laughs> that's, okay. That's right. uh, you know, in fact, I you know when you work for yourself, nobody does your work for you. Right. Uh, but I'm starting to do personal reviews now, and I'm just gonna I'm gonna be tough on myself next time. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not working hard enough. I'm gonna really get on me in my next <laughs> annual review. You're not gonna get a raise. I'm not getting a raise, and I tell you what, I'm gonna come down hard. <laughs> that's right. That's so. You, so you're constantly working on games. I, I, I know you tell me that every once in a while you'll pitch a game. You just kind of throw it out there. If it sticks, great. If not, I'm moving on to something else. Absolutely. I mean, you know, look, and, and I, this is my advice to any designer. I know when you're young and hungry, man, you really, really want somebody to pick up game. Just relax. Present the game. If it's fun and it's good, somebody's going to pick it up. But, you know, when you're tense and you're presenting it, that's that, that probably doesn't come off as well as if just having fun playing the game. You know, mm -hmm. so I just try to play my games with with companies, and if they like them and want to publish them, they usually contact me. And if they don't like them and don't want to publish them, well, you know, somebody else will, or somebody else won't. I'm, look, I've got a wall and closet full of what I call unfit games. Mm -hmm. You know, I had fun making them, but they just didn't work good enough to go out. Mm -hmm. And I and I think that's, I, I'll be honest with you, I think that's one of our problems that are interested today. We have 3,000 games getting published now, or whatever the number is. I hear it's 3,000. Yes. And, and a lot of those games are good. A lot of those games are bad. Mm -hmm. There's some gems in there. But it doesn't matter whether it's good, bad, or a gem. It comes out of this tsunami of, of games, and a week after it comes out, there's 30 more that came yeah, out. Scary. And if you, and if the company doesn't market it, or if it doesn't get seen, it doesn't get whatever, it just it kind of just passes away. I don't think it's the best thing for the industry, but it kind of is what it is. I, I, I would wish that we would focus on publishing just the really, really good games, okay? And 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 I, I would think the industry would be better, but. Well, let me you ask know. you this, do you think we'll contract back to that point or no. beyond the point of no return? It's no. just wave uh, and wave of games from now well, on. Well, I mean, um, I, I, you know, I don't know. Sure, I, I mean, I mean, speculation. But, but my, my opinion is, there's people who believe that, but as long as people can go on Kickstarter and get money, as long as they can, you know, uh, get you know full service in in China to put their games together and all that type of stuff at at, at you know a, a cheap price, uh, I think that you're you're constantly going to have games coming out, and and you know everybody can form a company, put a game out. Uh, they'll sell some of those games. They may have their garage full of the rest of them. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, they may be fortunate enough to produce that real gym that, that mm -hmm. continues going. But I think what it does in the industry is it makes it a lot tougher for all the game designers to get, you know, what we used to call Evergreen, a uh, game mm -hmm. that gets, you know, published mm -hmm. year after year after year, which pays us. Right. And when you take Evergreen away from a game designer, and I'm on the upper end of that, so I'm not really worried about that. I'm retired from at and and all that other kind of stuff. But if you look at the Evergreen situation not being available to most designers, that puts them in what I call the sharecropper world, which is you design a game, you put it out, they publish it, it sells one printing, it goes out of print, you better be working on another one because you can only live from, from season to season as a sharecropper, you don't ever get ahead. As opposed to you put a game out, it goes evergreen, put another game out, it goes evergreen, or even if it only goes evergreen for two or three years. You know, you get three or four games out there where you're making money, mm -hmm. and that's the best situation for a game designer. Now, you know, once again, I, I just think that's the world we're in now, mm -hmm. I, and I, I doubt it's going to change. But, one, you know, that doesn't say that we're not having some really great games created. Sure, no. But you can make a great game and have it get buried under a tsunami of, of games that came out over the next month. Yeah, know. I remember on a, a recent video I did on my YouTube channel, I actually talked about Evergreen Games and talked about how it seemed like uh, you can go back 10, 15 years and that's when it seems a lot of the Evergreen titles came out. Absolutely. And, and year to year, yes. the number of potential Evergreens are decreasing. Absolutely. And I remember uh, a Christian from uh, FFG last year was interviewed and he says, really, you got about two weeks for a game to come two out on weeks? the shelf, two weeks for it to grab hold. And if you don't grab hold in those two weeks, it's done because like you said, another two weeks later, something else is coming out. Wow. Shoot, I was walking through here with uh, Planet of the Apes, uh, you know, just, just this morning. People go, oh, is that a new game coming out? I said, no, it came out in October. You know, if you didn't catch the week it came out before it got buried under 100 other games, you, you, you don't know. Right. Uh, you know, people play it, people like it, it's enjoyable, but, you know, they, they have 50 choices on the week it came out. They have 50 more the next week, they have 50 more the next week. The problem is the pie doesn't get bigger. It doesn't really. I mean, we've grown the industry some. I think there's more gamers there, and that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. 
but by and large the pies stayed the same size so the slices all go down so even if even if a game comes out and doesn't sell much the fact that it sells some takes a little bit away from these companies you know that that, that are producing and developing and, and doing the steady titles for you and I just it, it just is what it is and I think it's the industry so I'm not complaining about it I'm looking at it you know from a scientific perspective and saying this is what it is so for young game designers you know their, their goal is how do you break out of that sharecropper mode because mm -hmm. if all you're doing is making a game and then getting paid for that game and then, then it's gone after six right. months or a year. You're making another game and getting paid for that game. Uh, it's very tough. It's very tough for you to make it as a full-time game designer. So how, how is this market going to be sustainable if the, if the slices are smaller and people get printing stuff that doesn't make money? It seems like there's going to be Losing on investment eventually, if one of the games doesn't take off, that, that publisher well, I, just goes away? Well, no, no. I, I, I kind of look at it as, you ever watch these, uh, okay, did you did you see uh, the Avengers movie? Mm -hmm. Where they all were coming through the, the wall when they opened it up, the no, enemy coming no, through? No spoilers here. Okay, no spoilers. If you haven't seen the Avengers movie, <laughs> nothing it. happens in it. Okay. <laughs> but if you have seen the Avengers movie, they open up a section of a force field to allow yes. the enemy to come in. And they wipe out a bunch of that enemy, but more enemy just comes in. And the same thing happens here. You know, young guys make a game, they, they don't sell it to a company, or well, they do sell it to a company, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, it gets published, you know, it, it comes out, they sell their 2,000 copies or whatever, it goes out of print, or they don't sell their 2,000 copies, basically it goes out of print. And so if they were doing it themselves, they're saying, okay, I, I, maybe they give up at that point and they don't do it anymore. But there's a whole mob of new designers walking through the door with their ideas yeah. that uh, are, are going to fill that slot. Mm -hmm. So it, nothing changes as far as that's concerned. I mean, that was, I originally thought a couple of years ago when all the Kickstarter stuff started that, you know, this is a fad that'll burn itself out possibly in time. And, and I'm not complaining about Kickstarter. I still like it's bring us, brought us some great games in, 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 in some cases. But, you know, if you go on Kickstarter on any given week, there's like 300 games oh, yeah. out there. Okay. And yeah, game, games are, I think, the second largest sector of Kickstarter Absolutely. at this point. Yeah. And at one point, they were the largest, okay? Yeah. Uh, so, so, they, so even the rules didn't get followed in Kickstarter because, you know, it was a wild, wild west out there. Mm -hmm. You used to have things like you had to have a finished game, you had to have finished art, and then they kind of let people just, oh, here's a picture of what it's going to look like. You know, it's a hand drawing on a napkin, okay? Uh, and if it brought in money, Kickstarter's like, yeah, that's good for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Million dollars, we're in, that's fine, you know? And so, so you end up with games like, okay, somebody's going to get up somebody and say that exploding cats in... in exploding in, kittens. In, exploding kittens in... in in Target, okay, mm -hmm. that's a multi-million dollar sure. game that I would question as a multi-million dollar game. But regardless, if that's your favorite game, don't take don't take offense if that's your favorite game. I'm I, look, everybody has you have the argument about what's a fun game. What's a fun game is what's fun to you. It's exactly. Okay? So everybody is very, very subjective. And so I would say that all games are fun with the right people. Mm -hmm. Even exploding kittens, I can play with the right people. Okay. Mm -hmm. It'd have to be like really late at night. But yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I could enjoy that. But I, but I don't think the market changes. So I, okay. I think it's just what it is. So, so as a designer, how do I look at that? I make the games I want to play, period. Yeah. Those are the games that make me happy. Those are the games that hopefully somebody out here, some of you guys want to play those games. And uh, if you do, a publisher's going to pick them up. But if you don't, then a publisher's not going to pick them up. I have to go on to something else. But uh, if I was 25, I might look at that a little bit different. Mm -hmm. I have a question, yeah. uh, kind of related to the old force field opening with the stuff coming through. And no spoilers. You didn't see the movie. <laughs> I didn't yeah. see the movie. Yeah. What happens yeah. next? My question is about <laughs> Infinity War. Uh, tell me what happens at the I'd end. I'd really like to know, what's the sequel? Uh, it also <laughs> seems like, you know, the publishers that do exist already seem to be churning out more and more games each year sure as well. Are. Well, you know, with you know, between Panda Publishing in China or the printers and you know the other printer right. facilities we have, it doesn't seem like the number of printing facilities is growing at the same pace. So we're trying to smush more games through the printing areas that we have available. So how do you think that is going to be affecting either the quality or the number of, of games that we're able to produce? You know, and how that's going to affect the marketplace? Well, I think it does affect the quality. I mean, you get some games where. You know, the, the box is already coming apart. Uh, you know, the, the part that's mounted the box is coming up. It's not the company. High quality company is gonna get the, you're gonna get the best service. Mm -hmm. But once again, they, 
you know, if you're if you're a big company, you've got a big payroll, you've got you've got capital expenses, you've got all those things, and you're used to selling X number of games. And what now if it comes out and it doesn't sell X number of games? Okay, so that has that has long-term effects. If you're the small guy, then then you get what you get. You're just wanting people to buy your game, okay, and and, and hope that they all say that it's great. So uh, it, I think that the the fact the fact that there's not many printers. Uh, not enough printers, they'll be, look, there, there are more entrepreneurs in China than you shake a stick at. And if they think there needs to be more printing companies, they'll put more printing companies in if they think they can get the work, okay? Uh, I, I heard one Chinese printer uh, quote on a game to, to a company I was doing business with that uh, if they would move their work to them, they would print a game that most of the companies would, the total cost was going to be 7 or $8 for, for the box, they'd do the whole thing for $2 if they would move their stuff to them and stay with them in the future. So these guys are very entrepreneurial, okay, mm -hmm. over there. And uh, and they can afford to be to some extent, you know, uh, simply because all the work's going to them. Mm -hmm. Right now the United States printers cannot compete with them. Mm -hmm. And it kind of is what it is. So, you know, from an, from an economy type perspective, um, I don't see a big change in the future. So, you know, I just, just look at it as a fact. Know the facts. If you're a designer, know the facts. If you're a company, know the facts. But for a lot of companies now, they see that people are doing this. There's a wave of games coming out stuff. So they're willing to publish. If it's a card game, yeah, we'll publish it. You know, we'll do 2,000 copies. That doesn't cost us very much. And if it's a hit, great. If it's not a hit, we'll go on to the next one. Yeah. And that seems to be the that seems to be one of the. Now, when you do a game like mine, you know. I got asked to, to do an expansion to a game and said, but here's the rules, okay, we're having all these designers come in and do 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 this game piece, and it's gonna, I think, I don't know who's published, I won't, I won't say who's published it, but basically you could only use the components that are already in the game, okay, so it's just cards, nothing else. Okay. All right, so it's like 18 cards. I told them, look, I need 200 cards and about 100, 100 tokens, so, <laughs> I, you know, I, you'll have to deal with a lot, of, a lot of other designers could do that. I said, I, I can't go that small, guys. You're gonna, you have to let me do more. I need like four stacks of cards here, and, you know, and this much table space. So. Now, it's funny, Chaz, you mentioned about the uh, the printers. It's like those are the ones that actually probably love this environment where there's a new game coming out, 30 new games coming out every four weeks because they're just printing, printing, printing. They don't care whether it sells. They've already got their money. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, the, the, you know, it's moved. Uh, the money, in a way, has moved up the moved back the food chain a little bit now, you know, from this is not necessarily the publisher, but the printer now uh, because they have all the work. Uh, regardless of whether the game sales, or I'm not. gonna say something you know that somebody's not gonna like because it's political. But I'll tell you what, I, having worked with United States printers in the past, I did that on my job because I did Yellow Pages, and the fact that the United States printers cannot compete with China, and and Trump's doing this little uh, uh, tariff war with China, mm -hmm. I wish he would do something about the printing because, to be honest with you, I'd like to see these games printed in the United States. That's mm -hmm. just my personal opinion. Yeah. I know that uh, Stephen Bonacore, uh, I believe it was Terraforming Mars. Yes, he yes. worked with somebody he and had it printed. Great. Or, I, I, would love to, I would love to see at least 50% of the game work come back to the United States because I can guarantee you right now it's less than 5%. Yeah, well, I guess it's hard to compete with the prices. Like you said, the pri you, it's like, the li you can literally print it, ship it, get it back over here at about a third of the price of what it costs you to print yeah. it here in most cases. And so these young designers. I mean, that's, they're just well, that's, have to go that's what you got. I mean, I understand them, and it's yeah. what they've got to do. What I'm saying is, something's not right there. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so now, many people know you as a designer. You said you used to work at AT and T. You got this career in the in the AT and T, and you got the, uh, the board game designs. But I know a little something about you that happened in the '80s yeah. that I think is very interesting. If you watched a couple days ago, we had Rob. You know, you know, you're talking about for most of the people watching were born now. So yeah, go, go I, I know, but still. Still, uh, where Rob Davio was couple, owned a couple days ago, talked about how he and I like to talk baseball. Uh, Richard, why don't you tell us what you're known for in the 80s when it comes to Major League Baseball? In 1981, I designed the Chicago White Sox baseball uniform. They actually had a contest. Okay. okay? And uh, my father in law is from Chicago. He's a big Cub fan, okay? But he saw it in there the White Sox were going to get a uniform. Now, the uniform they had mm -hmm. was that black one with the stupid white collars, the pilgrim mm -hmm. type collars, if you remember yeah, how ugly yeah. that was. So they had a contest. And what they said was, you know, we, we want to go to some red, white, and blue type thing. Although they didn't, there was no restrictions, okay? You do whatever you wanted to. So I actually took a, about four hours, I did this uniform up. Uh, and uh, submitted it. Forgot about it like I do most of my stuff because I think, what are the odds of me winning this thing? Not good. 
And then I get called from the uh, Chicago Tribune saying, you know you're one of the six finalists out of, I think, 31,000 things submitted. Wow. You're one of the six <laughs> finalists that's in it. And it's uh, three people who are not, not designers, not fashion designers, and three people, three fashion design firms. Right. And so what they told me what we're going to do is we're going to make your uniform up. It's going to be worn for 21 home games. The fans get to vote for it. And uh, we, I got to go up to one of the games where the models came around and, yep. you know, and all that kind of stuff. Fan, they hand you a port. They had a portfolio. They give the, when you, every time you come to one of those games, you had a portfolio. It had all six of the designs on it as well as you could see the stuff. And so I went up there and, and uh, toured in, and, and uh, uh, somebody in the newspaper told me, you know, you're like 150,000 votes ahead, you know, with about a week to go. And uh, so, yeah, so it won. So it was, it was great. I got to go up there, and um, uh, they took us out on the field, gave me a uniform, met the owner, you know. Uh, they gave me, I won season tickets behind home plate, the oh, second wow. row behind home plate, which I sold because they didn't live in Chicago to a dentist <laughs> who gave me enough money to buy a piano. So my daughter, all my kids play piano. Okay, so that, that worked out. I kept a couple of games, but yeah. by and large, I had to give all of them up. But it's the uniform with the stripe across the yep. chest. It says socks, and it's now their Sunday special. So really? yeah, it's their Sunday special. So uh, so a few years ago, uh, it hit its 30-year anniversary. Mm -hmm. ESPN called me up. They interviewed me. I have a guy who does. <laughs> I, I did not know this. I had a guy who does nothing but uniforms at ESPN. <laughs> That's all he does. Okay, is uniforms. Okay, wow. he's their uniform expert. And so he called me up. He did an interview with me. He told me that. Um, are you aware that uh, we can only trace one major league uniform back to its designer, and that's you? He said the <laughs> others come from you know firms sure. or you know nobody knows who in the organization came mm -hmm. up with it or whatever. I said I don't know that, but that's that's nice to know. And so uh, uh, so my wife actually we planned a trip to Chicago, and she surprised me because she arranged for when we went up there. It was a Sunday game. And we went up there, and, and uh, she'd called the stadium. They, they took us out on the field before the game. They took us underneath where they had the World Series trophy. Uh, WGN interviewed me again, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and they came out, and they were all wearing, they were all wearing the uniform I designed because it was their, it was their Sunday special. And it, it was funny because hot dog vendors and stuff would come talk to me because they, they saw me doing the interview. Oh, we, lo we love Sundays because we wear black and white all week long. And then, you, <laughs> then on Sunday, they come out in all these colors. Okay? You know, so, so it was nice. It's a nice piece of history. And, you know, I was in uh, Cooperstown a few years ago, and they actually have that uniform in the Cooperstown Hall of Fame. So it's, it's nice to be associated with that. Yeah, and so. if you want to see what that looks like, just go Google Richard Lania's White Sox uniform, and you'll see images and, and stories about it. It's printed on my mind what it looks like, but I think that's just one side of Richard that you may not know about. Now, were you a graphic designer? I, yeah, I, gra I graduated with an art degree, and when okay. I first started, when I, when I say AT&T, originally I was with the subsidiary company, the, the Berry Company, which did Yellow Pages. So I was in Yellow Pages. When I started, this is how old phone I am, them. people. Yellow Pages used to be these things yeah, in this okay. book where you looked up phone numbers for businesses. Exactly. When I first started in Yellow Pages, and this is really how old I am, <laughs> We had to hand letter the ads. I remember, oh, wow. I remember, because I didn't take any hand lettering in college, so because I had a fine arts degree, and literally I thought they're going to fire me the first week. Every ad, I, it took it took me like a day to do an ad, and then come back and go, this lettering's bad. I'm like, ah, I'm doing it again, okay. <laughs> then about a year and a half later, we got this uh, machine that would make type and strips, and you would pull it off and and, and strip mm, it on things. Yeah. So we're way before computers here, guys. So I remember doing that, yeah. the kind of paste up in journalism class in high there school. There you go. Yep, yep. And so, but yeah, but hand lettering, that was a bear. I'm oh. telling you, every time I knew, you know, of course, I, I'm, I'm young and on the job, the boss would bring dad back. I'm like, oh my God, he's going to fire me this time. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, your O's have a problem here. They don't look like O's. You know? <laughs> so I had to do something else. So, you know, so I was a gra I started out at the bottom of the, the business. I became a graphics manager, ultimately office managers. And ultimately I took over all, you know, printing, delivery, publishing responsibilities when I was the vice president of, of publishing for the Berry Company. Then I got pulled over to Bell South, where I took over all of IT because, because this is this is a time when nobody knew anything about technology, and you're like, hey, you use a computer, you must be good at IT. I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I became their chief information <laughs> yeah. officer. Here's what I knew. There are a lot of people who know a lot about computers. Hire them. <laughs> 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 and then when they say something, listen to them, okay? So I was good at that. And then I was good at interpreting what they said and telling it back to the bosses who had no idea what we were doing. So. That's how you move up in the world. That's how you yeah. move up yeah. in the world. So, so then AT&T bought us, and then all, you know, once they bought us, uh, Really, I was in a position where I could retire, so that was great. Wow, that's, that's awesome. So, kind of wrap this whole thing up. I'm sure people are curious, do you have any games that uh, you're working on that will be coming out soon that's uh, that's ready to come out in the next several months that you have your name yeah. on? Uh, Batman, the animated series. Mm -hmm. Really, okay, if you like dice games, you're going to like it. You get to play <laughs> Batman and Batgirl and Robin and Catwoman actually helps them out. You get to be the uh, police department. And you move around on these buildings and on these battlefields and you fight the master villains and all their little henchmen and stuff like that. And you move through four acts of that. Okay. And basically it's roll dice, pick a die, put it on your character to activate their powers. And all the characters feel super heroic and, mm -hmm. and stuff. So, so yeah, so I think it's, it's a lot of fun. That's the closest one I have coming out. We got several with companies in, in different stages, and gotcha. you know I'm I'm, uh, I'm I'm working on several at the same time. Uh, especially probably my biggest one I'm working on is a, a I'm working toward a second edition of Defenders of the Realm here at some point. Oh, nice, so, nice. Uh, people which, love that game. Yeah, which which brings a lot more story into it. So a lot more background, a lot more story, and, and a lot more heroic actions that you can do. So and I bet there's dice involved. There are dice involved. Yeah, you know, I, I like dice, and uh, but I actually have made a few games that don't have dice. So, very few games that don't have dice. So, uh, Richard, thank you so much for coming on. I would say, where can people find you? But I know that you don't have one of the little fancy phones. Or not going to be on the phone. Not going to do. So, you know, if people want to know why my hair is not totally gray at my age, just because I don't do any of that stuff. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's, totally, that's totally fair. So, once again, if you're... Uh, you're, like you say, Catch you're me at a con. I'll, I'll be glad to talk to you anytime. Obviously, I'll be glad to talk to you. Yeah, we'll talk to these two chumps. Uh, more than likely, you've got a game that in your library that you've played at one time designed by this man, especially if you're into the whole Arkham series from FFG. He's had his little fingerprints on a lot of those games. So, Richard, thank you so much for taking time uh, to come on. And we are going to take a break and be back at 4 p.m. Eastern Time with our final segment of these four days of live streaming where we're going to have Mike Elliott on and then Chaz and I are going to wrap up this whole thing and put a nice little bow on it. Yep. So until then, we'll be back in about 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Richard, thanks again. Thank you, guys. And thanks all of you that play my games. I appreciate it.